Groups are different from each other in umpteen ways. And, and to say, let's have the presumption that they are the same except for the way they're, they're treated uh, is, is nonsense. It's never been true, and I don't know why we would think it's true here today. What's going on, YouTube? It's Flay Talk back for another reaction. Thomas Sowell video, debunking systemic racism and having common decency. What, what would you do about our school systems? Oh, my goodness. I'll try, I'll try to be rational. Uh, <laughs> do try. They, they, are, they, are, they are so awful. Uh, but the public has no idea. What, I'm reading a book about the schools, and the, the woman who's writing it, Diane Ravage, is talking about how teachers have due process before they can be fired. Now, uh, you, when you look into the facts of it, uh, right down here in, I think it was Atherton, they, it cost a half a million dollars to fire <laughs> one incompetent teacher. Uh, you know, you, you, you don't have a big enough budget, <laughs> you know. And right. in, in, New, in New York, you have something called the rubber room. These are teachers who are so incompetent that the, the, the principals don't want them in the classroom, uh, you know. And they get paid full salary, and they show up, and they accrue uh, um, uh, uh, pension rights and so forth. And uh, I, the last time, I forget how many millions of dollars are spent a year in New York paying for teachers who don't teach, and in fact don't do anything, but show up at, at the same time as if they were teaching, and they read magazines or whatever they feel like doing. Uh, and this, this farce goes on uh, at a time when they don't have enough money to provide the kids with uh, decent uh, supplies. So how do we scale back this? I mean, you can talk, we can talk about it through the lens of education, but in any, in any area where the government has taken on a bigger role than it's supposed to. I think one of the things you hear all the time is it's sort of too late, I think a lot of people think. It's too late to take back no, that government power. No, you, 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 heavens, uh, during the Reagan administration, that was the only time I know of when the Federal Register grew smaller, that is, where they compile all the laws that have been passed in a given time. So it can be done. It's not. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's not uh, e easy, but it can be done. Someone wants. Uh, there was some issue with, uh, that Reagan was discussing, and someone said, "You know, it, it's complicated." He says, "Not complicated. It's just not easy to do." I mean, right now, we, I, 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 one of the big forces out here are, are the talks about affordable housing, and they're appointing uh, blue ribbon committees to look into why there's no affordable housing. And I think that that's that's like appointing a blue ribbon committee to to to, to explain why the ground is wet after after a rain. <laughs> I mean, it's very simple. If you prevent people from building housing and the population is growing, you're going to have a housing shortage, yeah. and you won't have affordable housing. It's really you know economics won during the first first two weeks. They're not very good at taking economics 101, I don't think. So, so would your answer be in almost every case to just scale back government, scale back regulation? Is no, it, depends, any, on what, depends on what they're yeah. doing. There are, there are some things uh, that government is necessary to do. So what, what are those type of things that you Oh, that? for security, first of all, having, having dependable laws. Uh, some people think that if you're uh, uh, for free markets, that means you don't think the government should do anything. No. Uh, you can, the free markets don't operate except within a framework of laws. That's wholly different from having them operate with politicians uh, jumping in at, un at unpredictable times to suddenly uh, pass some new uh, legislation. This is all new information to me. My perspective on this would be, why don't we just get someone who knows a lot about education system and have a good discussion about like what we can possibly do instead of just sitting here not talking about it. But again, like, this is, I'm, I'm not too um, all versed on this subject. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I definitely agree with those um, limited government perspective. I think it should be like specific rules and regulations that we know not to cross. Sort of electing more libertarian minded politicians then? I mean, is that really the only way we can change things, do you think? No, I think the main thing, people have to know what the facts are themselves. Uh, if, if everyone knew what all the facts were, I think you'd have an entirely different set, set of people elected. I, I can't believe that, that either of the uh, presidential candidates in, 19, in 2016 uh, would, have, would have been the candidates if you had an informed public. Yeah, we're not very good at that. How, how much of this do you think is part of the media's fault? That's one of the things. That... Well, the media are, are, are mostly uninformed. No, no, they're not uninformed. They are misinformed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 they, and they simply do not ch check the facts. Uh, on large issues or small. Yeah. What, what can we do to fix that, do you think? I mean, I suppose this, no, right? No, right? no, like yeah. But, writing but, books like this? Well, but I think more fundamentally, 
the public that votes has to itself become informed and not be so easily stampeded by slogans and a few numbers thrown around, uh, like, you know, women make X percent of what men make and so on. Yeah. Uh, and when I was stud studying that some years ago, for example, uh, I found out that uh, young, young um, uh, female doctors made much less money than young male doctors. And that seemed like very odd. And so I, but when you look in, into it, you discover that young male doctors work an average of 500 hours a year more than young female doctors. And they get paid for the 500 hours. Mm -hmm. But, but there's, there's no reason why the women and men should be doing the same thing. Their circumstances are different. So are there any laws that are in place right now that you believe are discriminatory one way or another toward, towards any community or against any community? Oh, I would have to write a much larger book to cover them all. <laughs> uh, the minimum wage law is absolutely devastating. Uh, the policy of saying that you cannot have uh, more kids from one uh, ethnic group disciplined in the school than from another is nonsense. I mean, uh, <laughs> Groups are different from each other in umpteen ways. And, and to say, let's have the presumption that they are the same except for the way they're, they're treated uh, is nonsense. It's never been true, and I don't know why we would think it's true here today. So I do sense yeah, well, that some of what you just said there quick? is bubbling up. I don't really yeah. understand what he said just there. He, he was saying that, well, when you look at uh, two ethnic groups uh, and the children within them, they are treated different. But when we look at things and treat the kids as if they were the same, and the only difference is how they're treated. It doesn't really work out like that because they, okay. they weren't treated the same, so they won't act the same. I think he's talking about affirmative action, but I'm gonna get into it in a little bit. Up into the national conscious mm -hmm. because I get a ton of email from black conservatives now. Mm -hmm. People that feel uh, that they haven't been represented fairly or that the, the, you know, the so-called leaders of the black community that are on television all mm -hmm. the time are actually preaching the complete reverse of everything that you've said here. Yes. Do, do you sense that there is some sort of growing conservative movement well, in the black community? There was a time when, when uh, that, that community would have consisted of me and Walter Williams. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know Walter used to say we were the two of us should never fly on the same plane, otherwise the whole movement <laughs> will, will, will uh, disappear if the plane yeah. goes down. Uh, well, I, I mentioned I, to you before we started that Larry Elder caused my awakening because yeah. I was a progressive and I said something to him about uh, systemic racism mm. on air mm. and he beat me senseless with facts. And I had to go back and reassess well, what because, was wrong with my thinking. Well, you know, in, in, one of the, in one of the chapters there, I have a little section about uh, uh, the era of apartheid under, in South Africa. And, I, and I, I had that in there because there's so much argument about how much racism is there and so forth. And I said, let's test this hypothesis in a setting where there's absolutely no doubt of, 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 of it. And that's apartheid in South Africa uh, with a government where blacks are not allowed to vote and so forth. And you then apply the economic principles and you find that the economic principles apply in South Africa. That uh, there are some occupations. See, blacks weren't allowed by law to be in certain occupations more than a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. And in some occupations, couldn't be hired at all. In some of those occupations where they couldn't be hired at all, well, illegal to hire them at all, there were more blacks hired than there were whites because there are economic factors that come in. And you don't just pass a law and that automatically produces the results you want. Yeah. Can you go into some of the economic factors that you mentioned there? Because I thought it was sort of interesting about the, the types of jobs that black yeah, people the, had and why that would affect... Well, it's, it's, no, it's the competitiveness of the industry. In a competitive industry, uh, discrimination in the, in, the, in the sense that we, that we use for anti-discrimination laws, uh, it costs the discriminator as well as the others. Now, insofar as that price can be evaded by the discriminator, he will, he will discriminate. For example, minimum wage laws. Let, when you have a minimum wage law, uh, you have more people applying for jobs in those categories uh, then there are jobs available mm -hmm. because the, the raising the raising the wage rate causes more people to apply and employers to hire fewer because they're more expensive. And so you have a chronic surplus. Now, if you've got a chronic surplus in an industry, it costs nothing to discriminate. Mm -hmm. But if, and I, and and but it, but if you have a competitive market, then of course it does cost something 
that for every person that you discriminate against who's qualified, you've got to hire somebody else. When it's highly competitive in the sense that you can't pick everybody. You have to pick the most qualified, even if like that person is uh, black, uh, you have to pick them because it's a question of efficiency. Saying that if you lose a minimum wage worker, it doesn't cost much to replace them. But if you lose someone that is working like a high field, like a competitive aspect field, if you have to fire him, you have to hire someone to replace him. And that costs a lot because those people there, they're of high quality, like their expertise is valuable compared to the people that are in the minimum wage. I think that's what he said. You saying. can't choose between color. You can't choose between skin color or anything because yeah. uh, that person has other values that you prioritize over the color of your skin mm -hmm. versus like, the minimum saying. wage job. He's saying that discrimination only exists at like the minimum wage level. He, he's saying that discrimination only happens when you can't do it. Uh, for every person that you discriminate against who's qualified, you've got to hire somebody else. And you've got to raise that pay cut rate in order to get uh, people in. So I show how, how competitive industries have much less discrimination than, say, uh, regulated public utilities. Anti-discrimination laws, like, for example, affirmative action, they actually will be at a disadvantage to employers. If they choose to hire people on a basis of race instead of skill, then they will be at a loss. Reading it, if you were ever going to talk about how now technology is also changing this, so we see a lot of these movements for $15 minimum wage, and I know why you don't think that's a great idea, but even now where we see McDonald's and some of these other places just replacing people with Oh, iPads yes. and computers. This, this has been happening. I don't know. When I grew up in Harlem, they, when you went into a movie theater, this is a little neighborhood movie theater in Harlem, there would be a kid who would walk behind, right down the aisle with you with a flashlight to show you to your seat, <laughs> you see. And so now, now that we have so many compassionate people who want, to, want people to be paid a, minute, uh, a living wage, <laughs> you, you stumble down the, down the aisle to your seat the best way you can because yeah. they're not going to pay you that kind of money you know, uh, that's, that's unrelated to productivity. Yeah. What would you say to the people? I hear a growing movement of people saying, well, this is why we need a universal basic income because technology is going to force, force so many people out of the workplace. Oh, that has been that is that, that that argument has been made for centuries, and it's, it's been proven wrong for centuries. Uh, I would ask the question: What has happened? We've moved in that direction already. We have lots of people who can live off the welfare state and not and not and not have to have to be productive. Uh, and how, 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 are they better people as a result of that? Uh, one of I saw some time back, and I haven't followed this. That uh, young people, the suicide rates among young people were among the negative uh, consequences of the 1960s. Uh, people, you, you, you've taken all meaning out of people's lives, and so they find all kinds of crazy things to do, drugs, whatever. Uh, and then, again, it's not peculiar to the United States. This is, you find this in Britain, other countries. Uh, and so, again, people who say this almost never look at any facts about what's happened as we expanded the welfare state. Did people behave better? No. You know, I mean, when, when the argument for equality doesn't account for the result. Even though we're trying to add more equality in terms of, like, you know, anti-discrimination laws, the results show that suicide rates are going up. Just the act of equality, even though it sounds good, it's not doing good. One of the, one of the things that... The, moments that I remember very well when I was I was back into school in Harlem for some reason maybe doing research and I looked out the window and I said to, said you know I, when I was a teenager I used to walk a dog my dog in that park and look of, looks of horror came over the students faces because that that was a different world and so uh, and and when I tell them that I used to sleep out on a fire escape on hot summer nights because who, who could afford air conditioning and they think I'm a man from Mars. <laughs> People did that all over New York. They did it in Washington. They did it in North Carolina. Uh, relatives who are in Washington used to go down at Haynes Point down near the Jefferson Memorial on hot summer nights and sleep there till you know sometime after midnight when the when the when the heat wouldn't be so bad and they'd go home at, at that time. You'd be out of your mind to do that today. It'd be too dangerous. Yeah. So how do we sort of untie some of this? So my, my sister right now lives on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, not too far from Harlem, and she's in a half uh, rent stabilized or rent controlled oh, building yes. and, it, and half market price. She's on the market price, so she's paying to be in a two bedroom <laughs> in New York City. I don't even want to tell you how expensive it is. 
But then there are basically half of the building that's paying next to nothing. And yeah. that, of course, incentivizes people not to get off the dole. Because if you're living in yeah. a nice area on the Upper West Side, very cheap, why in the world would you ever get off the dole? How do we start solving these problems? And I know, I know facts is your, is your bedrock answer. Yes. But, but what can we do to, to get people to understand some of this stuff? Because it, it seems so basic to understand. If someone was giving you something uh, that you didn't earn, again, it's, this, hard this to, not, it's hard to... This, this is, again, this is common. One of this, in, in Europe, in England especially, it's a, it's a, it's a special problem because you, you, have, the, you have this place where, where, where your know, rent is subsidized and say you're in London and jobs are disappearing in London and they're opening up in Manchester. Now, if you go to Manchester, you, know, you, know, you, you get on a waiting list for that kind of job. Uh, and if you stay in, in, in London, you're unemployed, but your rent is low. Yeah. And so, so you slow down the, the movement of people, you slow down the turnover of people in these apartments. But again, most people who talk about this don't even talk in terms of if this, then that. They talk about it as this is how the world ought to be. Well, heck, I, I, I can think of all kinds of things of how I think the world ought to be. But unfortunately, most of those things involve a cost, a trade-off. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's mm -hmm. a system doing it better, doing freedom better than we're doing it here? For, for all the flaws that we have in this, in this system, is anyone doing it better than us? Oh, there, there may be marginally so. But I think most of the Western world is less free that, than it was, say, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. By, by what measurements do you view that? Oh, just the amount of, of regulations, uh, things you, you could, you, and, and also by consequences. I, I was reading uh, Milton Friedman's, he and his wife had a joint autobiography. And she, she's looking, at one point she says, she, she, looking back on the, the, the days when she would ride the IND subway in Manhattan, and what a joy it was, and she said, in those long gone days, and uh, the IND subway goes through Harlem. Uh, and Milton Friedman and his uh, wife, when they were still courting, used to go dancing at the Savoy Ballroom. Uh, ver very few people wanted, want and, and you know, the famous uh, theme song of Duke Ellington, Take the A Train. Mm -hmm. the, the A Train goes right through Harlem on the IND line. And uh, so Friedman, who was only five foot two, had no fear of being uh, mugged or uh, even accosted. And go there, they were, and this, this was common. There was, a, there was a black actress who uh, used to get finished with play and her socializing afterwards. And at one o'clock in the morning, she said she would be taking the uh, subway up to 155th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue by herself and, and walking home. Nobody does that these yeah. days. And so you have to look, one, at what are the facts? How did they change? And, 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 and you don't simply say, the other thing is that uh, they're saying um, the, the no child left behind thing with Bush. Mm -hmm. There are kids who go to school to raise hell and a, and a handful of those can prevent the whole class from learning anything. Now, the logical thing would be to separate those kids out uh, and let the ones who want to learn something, learn something. You yeah. can't do that because the ideology mm -hmm. says no. And, again, so, and so you sacrifice whole generations of poor and minority kids for this ideology and this utopian notion. Yeah, and, and we end up in an odd dystopia probably. Yeah, and Milton Friedman used to say, uh, the best is the enemy of the good. I used to just be so upset at some of the kids who just show up just to like cause hell you know, over there doing i used to like love math and science class i used to like go home and watch the science channel so i loved like, everything <laughs> about it and that's when i started to cover as much stuff as i could so then that way i knew what the hell the person on tv was saying when i went home uh because sometimes it kind of helped clear up i used to ask uh, my my teachers a couple of questions too so it'd be kind of fun if we had time but some of those kids are uh, so now we didn't have time and I used to like be really upset about that. And I felt like I was being held back. Like what did you wish well, they did differently? We can get those kids up out of the classroom, bro. Like, <laughs> straight sit like, or just ignore them. If you ignore them, they would have like shut up or something. But they just kept bringing them up. For this whole no child is behind policy, if you want if there's like, some genuine like, you know, sympathy for the kids that are being are behind in class, the the only way to solve the problem is to make sure that we we help them without at the same time hurting the kids that are actually trying. And of course, the you know, the best way to do that, like you said, is to just move them out of the class. I think if the, if the kids that are actually trying had to somehow face a consequence, 
because of this no child left behind policy, then that's still children, I guess, being not not left behind, but being ignored or being dismissed. Every child deserves an opportunity, but there are some kids that don't want. There's some kids that just don't want to have that opportunity. I just feel like the opportunities is really what we should emphasize rather than the outcome. You would have to have good teachers for that. You would have to teach, I mean, train the teachers better. I agree. I agree. With the way things are right now, it wouldn't go, it wouldn't fly. And of course, it would be better if everybody could be educated at the same time. It can't be done. So as someone that has survived the, the arrows and, and the, the venom that the left can throw at you, because I, I see a lot of this these days, I see even what they, they say to me, um, I find I get a lot of email from people saying, what, how, how can I be brave enough to do it? And, and I think it's particularly a unique situation for uh, minorities that consider themselves conservative or libertarian or a little bit to the right. So I mentioned Larry Elder before, and of course you and my friend David Webb, and I, you know, there there are some more black conservatives mm-hmm. than perhaps there used to be. Um, oh, no question about it. What would be if someone's watching this right now and just needs that little extra bit of courage to start saying? No, what no, they no, no. You, you, you have to look, look at the circumstances. I mean, I've advised some young people. Uh, do not go into, t- into t- teaching in public schools because uh, uh, the odds are so stacked against you. And people can write bad references from you for you, when, especially when you're young and, and, you, and what they say about you is all that the, someone sees. Now, by the time I was uh, teaching at some of these schools, I remember one place where the, the department chairman used to uh, threaten one of my, my colleagues that he wouldn't write good references for him. I had, I, I had uh, you know, I'd, I'd publish stuff while I was still in graduate school. I had Milton Friedman and uh, Joyce Staler to write references for me. What this guy said there as chair, chairman of the department wouldn't, wouldn't matter a bit. But, but most people don't, don't have that uh, situation. No. And so you, you, have to pick your, you have to pick your fights. So I want to, uh, time is limited here. I want to mention one thing that you say right at the end of the book, that really what we need more than anything else, perhaps, is common decency. Yes. And we've kind of lost that. It isn't common anymore. I mean, uh, when I was going to school and we'd have fights on the schoolyard grounds, when one, one guy was clearly beaten, whoever was the toughest kid uh, in the crowd would simply step in and stop it. Yeah. And the other guys would say, you want to fight? You can fight me. You know. Uh, that's that, what we need in the public square now. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but with, with, I mean, the poli- there's only so much the police can do. Uh, if, you, if you don't have common decency, the, 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 the cops ha- are not, not, not going to be able to, to, to handle it. Uh, and especially when everyone is second guessing it. I love it when people who have never fired a gun in their lives uh, say, why do the cops fire so many guns? Now, at one time, I, I taught pistol shooting in the Marine Corps. It doesn't surprise me in the slightest that they shot, shot, fired so many things under those conditions. But people... It's, people People can't be knowledgeable about everything, but they can be knowledgeable about the extent of their own ignorance, uh, even mm. if they have PhDs. Sir, this has okay. been a, a true honor and a pleasure. Yeah, and I, and I know That's I can it. see it in your eyes even. I like that quote. Like, if you don't know enough, just know enough to know that you don't know enough. <laughs> yeah, know, know the limitations of your own knowledge. All right, y'all. That was it for... Um, Debugging Systemic Racism Part 2. If you guys enjoyed this video, let us know by hitting that like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And we'll catch you on the next one. Peace.